the Battle of the Bulge was a major German offensive campaign launched through the densely forested Ardennes region of Wallonia in Belgium, France and Luxembourg on the Western Front toward the end of World War II in Europe. Hitler planned the offensive with the primary goal to recapture the important harbour of Antwerp. The surprise attack caught the Allied forces completely off guard. United States forces bore the brunt of the attack and incurred the highest casualties for any operation during the war. The battle also severely depleted Germany's war-making resources. The battle was known by different names. The Germans referred to it as Antonin Wichtemrin while the French named it the Bataille des Ardennes. The Allies called it the Ardennes counteroffensive. The phrase Battle of the Bulge was coined by contemporary press to describe the way the Allied front line bulged inward on wartime news maps and became the best-known name for the battle. The German offensive was supported by several subordinate operations known as Antonum and Bodenplatt, Grief, and WAC Currency Rung, as well as stopping Allied transport over the channel to the harbour of Antwerp. Germany also hoped these operations would split the British and American Allied line in half, and then proceed to encircle and destroy four Allied armies, forcing the Western Allies to negotiate a peace treaty in the Axis powers' favor. Once that was accomplished, Hitler could fully concentrate on the Eastern theater of war. The offensive was planned by the German forces with the utmost secrecy, minimizing radio traffic and moving troops and equipment under cover of darkness. Despite their efforts to keep it secret, the 3rd U.S. Army's intelligence staff predicted a major German offensive, and Ultra indicated that a substantial and offensive operation was expected or in the wind, although a precise date or point of attack could not be given. Aircraft movement from the Russian front and transport of forces by rail, both to the Ardennes, was noticed but not acted upon. According to a report later written by Peter Calvo Coressi and F. L. Lucas at the code breaking center Bletchley Park, near complete surprise was achieved by a combination of Allied overconfidence, preoccupation with Allied offensive plans, and poor aerial reconnaissance. The Germans attacked a weakly defended section of the Allied line, taking advantage of heavily overcast weather conditions, which grounded the Allies' overwhelmingly superior air forces. Fierce resistance on the northern shoulder of the offensive around Elsenborn Ridge and in the south around Bastogne blocked German access to key roads to the northwest and west that they counted on for success. Columns that were supposed to advance along parallel routes found themselves on the same roads. This and terrain that favored the defenders through the German advance behind schedule and allowed the Allies to reinforce their thinly placed troops. Improved weather conditions permitted air attacks on German forces in supply lines which sealed the failure of the offensive. In the wake of the defeat, many experienced German units were left severely depleted of men and equipment, as survivors retreated to the defenses of the Siegfried Line. About 610,000 American forces were involved in the battle, and 89,000 were casualties, including 19,000 killed. It was the largest and bloodiest battle fought by the United States in World War II. Background after the breakout from Normandy at the end of July 1944 and the landings in southern France on August 15, 1944, the Allies advanced towards Germany more quickly than anticipated. Allied troops were fatigued by weeks of continuous combat, their supply lines were stretched extremely thin, and supplies were dangerously depleted. While the supply situation improved in October, the manpower situation was still critical. General Eisenhower and his staff chose the Ardennes region, held by the 1st United States Army, as an area that could be held by as few troops as possible. The Ardennes were chosen because of a lack of operational objectives for the Allies, because the terrain offered good defensive positioning, the road network was minimal, and the Germans were known to be using the area within Germany to the east as a rest and refit area for their troops. The speed of the Allied advance coupled with an initial lack of deep water ports presented the Allies with enormous supply problems. Over the beach supply operations using the Normandy landing areas and direct landing LSTs on the beaches were unable to meet operational needs. The only deep water port the Allies had captured was Cherbourg, near the original invasion beaches, but the Germans had thoroughly wrecked and mined the harbour before it could be taken. It took the Allies many months to build up its cargo handling capability. The Allies captured the port of Antwerp, 
Belgium intact in the first days of September, but it was not operational until November 28. The Allies first had to clear the estuary of the Scheldt River that controlled access to the port of both German troops and naval mines. The limitations led to differences between General Dwight D. Eisenhower and Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery over whether Montgomery or American General Omar Bradley in the south would get priority access to supplies. German forces remained in control of several major ports on the English Channel coast until May 1945. The extensive destruction of the French railway system prior to D-Day, successful in hampering German response to the invasion, proved equally damaging to the Allies as it took time to repair the system's tracks and bridges. A trucking system nicknamed the Red Ball Express brought supplies to frontline troops, but transportation took five times as much fuel to reach the frontline near the Belgian border as was delivered. By early October the Allies suspended major offensives to improve their supply lines and availability. Montgomery and Bradley both pressed for priority delivery of supplies to their respective armies so they could continue their individual lines of advance and maintain pressure on the Germans. General Eisenhower, however, preferred a broad front strategy. He gave some priority to Montgomery's northern forces, who had the short-term goal of opening the urgently needed port of Antwerp and the long-term goal of capturing the Ruhr area, the industrial heart of Germany. With the Allies paused. German Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt was able to reorganize the disrupted German armies into a coherent defense. Field Marshal Montgomery's Operation Market Garden only achieved some of its objectives, while its territorial gains left the Allied supply situation worse than before. In October the Canadian First Army fought the Battle of the Scheldt, clearing the Westers Helder by taking Walteren and opening the port of Antwerp to shipping. As a result, by the end of October the supply situation had eased somewhat. Despite a lull along the front after the Scheldt battles, the German situation remained dire. While operations continued in the autumn, notably the Lorraine campaign, the Battle of Arken and fighting in the Ha one quarter of TGEN forest, the strategic situation in the West changed little. The Allies were slowly pushing towards Germany, but no decisive breakthrough was achieved. The Western Allies already had 96 divisions at or near the front, with an estimated 10 more divisions en route from the United Kingdom to the battle zone. Additional Allied airborne units remained in England. The Germans could field a total of 55 divisions. Adolf Hitler promised his generals a total of 18 infantry and 12 armoured or mechanised divisions for planning purposes. The plan was to pull 13 infantry divisions, two parachute divisions and six panzer-type divisions from the Oberkommando der Wehrmilk strategic reserve. On the Eastern Front the Soviets' Operation Bagration during the summer had destroyed much of Germany's army group center. The extremely swift operation ended only when the advancing Red Army forces outran their supplies. By November it was clear that Soviet forces were preparing for a winter offensive. Meanwhile, the Allied air offensive of early 1944 had effectively grounded the German air force, leaving the German army with little battlefield intelligence and no way to interdict Allied supplies. The converse was equally damaging. Daytime movement of German forces was almost instantly noticed and interdiction of supplies combined with the bombing of the Romanian oil fields starved Germany of oil and gasoline. One of the few advantages held by the German forces in November 1944 was that they were no longer defending all of Western Europe. Their front lines in the West had been considerably shortened by the Allied offensive and were much closer to the German heartland. This dramatically reduced their supply problems despite Allied control of the air. Additionally, their extensive telephone and telegraph network meant that radios were no longer necessary for communications which lessened the effectiveness of Allied ultra-intercepts. Nevertheless, some 40 to 50 decrypt messages were sent per day by ultra. They recorded the quadrupling of German fighter forces and noticed that the term used in the intercepted Luftwaffe Message a Euro jar currency Jaroff Morsche Euro implied preparation for an offensive operation. Ultra also picked up communica copywriters regarding extensive rail and road movements in the region. In addition, Ultra picked up German orders that movements should be made on time. Drafting the offensive, 
German leader Adolf Hitler felt that his mobile reserves allowed him to mount one major offensive. Although he realized nothing significant could be accomplished in the Eastern Front, he still believed an offensive against the Western Allies, whom he considered militarily inferior to the Red Army, would have some chances of success. Hitler believed he could split the Allied forces and compel the Americans and British to settle for a separate peace, independent of the Soviet Union. Success in the West would give the Germans time to design and produce more advanced weapons and permit the concentration of forces in the East. After the war ended, this assessment was generally viewed as unrealistic, given Allied air superiority throughout Europe and their ability to continually disrupt German offensive operations. Given the reduced manpower of their land forces at the time, the Germans believed the best way to seize the initiative would be to attack in the West against the smaller Allied forces rather than against the vast Soviet armies. Even the encirclement and destruction of entire Soviet armies, an unlikely outcome, would still have left the Soviets with a numerical superiority. Several senior German military officers, including Field Marshal Walter Model and von Rundstedt, expressed concern as to whether the goals of the offensive could be realized. They offered alternative plans, but Hitler would not listen. The plan banked on unfavorable weather, including heavy fog and low-lying clouds, which would minimize the Allied air advantage. Hitler originally set the offensive for late November, before the anticipated start of the Russian winter offensive. In the West supply problems began significantly to impede Allied operations, even though the opening of the port of Antwerp in late November improved the situation somewhat. The positions of the Allied armies stretched from southern France all the way north to the Netherlands. German planning for the counteroffensive rested on the premise that a successful strike against thinly manned stretches of the line would halt Allied advances on the entire Western Front. Several plans for major Western offensives were put forward, but Oberkommando der Wehrmacht quickly concentrated on two. A first plan for an encirclement maneuver called for a two-pronged attack along the borders of the U.S. forces around Aachen, hoping to encircle the U.S. Ninth Army and lead the German forces again in control of the excellent defensive grounds where they had fought the U.S. to a standstill just weeks before. A second plan called for a classic blitzkrieg attack through the weakly defended Ardennes Mountains a Euro mirroring the successful German offensive there during the Battle of France in 1940 a Euro aimed at splitting the armies along the US a Euro British lines and capturing Antwerp. Hitler chose the second plan, believing a successful encirclement would have little impact on the overall situation and finding the prospect of splitting the Anglo-American armies more appealing. The disputes between Montgomery and Patton were well known and Hitler hoped he could exploit this disunity. If the attack were to succeed in capturing Antwerp, four complete armies would be trapped without supplies behind German lines. Both plans centered on attacks against the American forces. Hitler believed the Americans were incapable of fighting effectively, and that the American home front was likely to crack upon hearing of a decisive American loss. Tasked with carrying out the operation were General Field Marshal Walther Model, the commander of German Army Group B, and Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, the overall commander of the German Army Command in the West, who had moved his base of operations to Kranzberg Castle. Model and von Rundstedt both believed aiming for Antwerp was too ambitious, given Germany's scarce resources in late 1944. At the same time they felt that maintaining a purely defensive posture would only delay defeat, not avert it. They thus developed alternative less ambitious plans that did not aim to cross the Meuse River. Models being in turn in Herbstenbel and von Rundstedt's full Martin. The two field marshals combined their plans to present a joint small solution to Hitler, who rejected it in favor of his big solution. Operation names, the Wehrmacht's code name for the offensive was on Turnemann Wichtimrin, after the German patriotic hymn Die Wichtimrin a name that deceptively implied the Germans would be adopting a defensive posture along the Western Front. The Germans also referred to it as Ardennes in offensive and Rundstedt defensive. The French name for the operation is Bataille des Ardennes. The battle was militarily defined by the Allies as the Ardennes counteroffensive, which included the German drive and the American effort to contain and later defeat it. The phrase Battle of the Bulge was coined by contemporary press to describe the way the Allied front line bulged inward on wartime news maps. 
After the war ended, the U.S. Army issued the Arden Alsace campaign citation to units that took part in operations in northwest Europe. The citation covered the Ardennes sector where the actual battle took place and units further south in the Alsace sector. The southern units held the line in their region but were not involved in the battle except for elements they sent north as reinforcements. While the Ardennes counteroffensive is the correct term in Allied military language, the official Ardennes Alsace campaign reached beyond the Ardennes battle region, and the most popular description remains simply the Battle of the Bulge. Planning OKW decided by mid-September, at Hitler's insistence, that the offensive would be mounted in the Ardennes, as was done in 1940. Many German generals objected, but the offensive was planned and carried out anyway. In 1940 German forces had passed through the Ardennes in three days before engaging the enemy, but the 1944 plan called for battle in the forest itself. The main forces were to advance westward to the Meuse River then turn northwest for Antwerp and Brussels. The close terrain of the Ardennes would make rapid movement difficult, though open ground beyond the Meuse offered the prospect of a successful dash to the coast. Four armies were selected for the operation. First was the 6th Panzer Army, under SS General Sepp Dietrich a year newly created on October 26, 1944. It incorporated the most senior and the most experienced formation of the Waffen SS the 1st SS Panzer Division Libsten Dart Adolf Hitler as well as the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jugend. The 6th Panzer Army was designated the northernmost attack force, having its northernmost point on the pre-attack battlefront nearest the German town of Menstrau. It was entrusted with the offensive's primary objective via Euro capturing Antwerp. The 5th Panzer Army under General Hasso von Manteuffel was assigned to the middle attack route with the objective of capturing Brussels. The 7th Army, under General Erich Brandenburger, was assigned to the southernmost attack, having its southernmost point on the pre-attack battlefront nearest the Luxembourg town of Ectenarch, with the task of protecting the flank. This army was made up of only four infantry divisions, with no large-scale armoured formations to use as a spearhead unit. As a result, they made little progress throughout the battle. Also participating in a secondary role was the 15th Army, under General Gustav Adolf von Zangen. Recently brought back up to strength and re-equipped after heavy fighting during Market Garden, it was located on the far north of the Ardennes battlefield and tasked with holding U.S. forces in place, with the possibility of launching its own attack given favorable conditions. For the offensive to be successful, Four criteria were deemed critical, the attack had to be a complete surprise. The weather conditions had to be poor to neutralize Allied air superiority and the damage it could inflict on the German offensive and its supply lines. The progress had to be rapid a Euro the Meuse River, halfway to Antwerp, had to be reached by day four. And Allied fuel supplies would have to be captured intact along the way because the Wehrmacht was short on fuel. The general staff estimated they only had enough fuel to cover one-third to one-half of the ground Antwerp in heavy combat conditions. The plan originally called for just under 45 divisions, including a dozen Panzer and Panzergnadier divisions forming the armoured spearhead and various infantry units to form a defensive line as the battle unfolded. By this time, however, the German army suffered from an acute manpower shortage and the force had been reduced to around 30 divisions. Although it retained most of its armor, there were not enough infantry units because of the defensive needs in the east. These 30 newly rebuilt divisions used some of the last reserves of the German army. Among them were Volksgnadier units formed from a mix of battle-hardened veterans and recruits formerly regarded as too young or too old to fight. Training time, equipment and supplies were inadequate during the preparations. German fuel supplies were precarious a euro those materials and supplies that could not be directly transported by rail had to be horse-drawn to conserve fuel, and the mechanized and panzer divisions would depend heavily on captured fuel. As a result, the start of the offensive was delayed from November 27 to December 16. Before the offensive the Allies were virtually blind to German troop movement. During the liberation of France, the extensive network of the French resistance had provided valuable intelligence about German dispositions. Once they reached the German border, this source dried up. In France, 
orders had been relayed within the German army using radio messages encyphered by the Enigma machine, and these could be picked up and decrypted by Allied codebreakers headquartered at Bletchley Park, to give the intelligence known as Ultra. In Germany such orders were typically transmitted using telephone and teleprinter, and a special radio silence order was imposed on all matters concerning the upcoming offensive. The major crackdown in the Wehrmacht after the 20 July plot to assassinate Hitler resulted in much tighter security and fewer leaks. The foggy autumn weather also prevented Allied reconnaissance aircraft from correctly assessing the ground situation. German units assembling in the area were even issued charcoal instead of wood for cooking fires to cut down on smoke and reduce chances of Allied observers deducing a troop build-up was underway. For these reasons Allied High Command considered the Ardenne a quiet sector, relying on assessments from their intelligence services that the Germans were unable to launch any major offensive operations this late in the war. What little intelligence they had led the Allies to believe precisely what the Germans wanted them to believe a Euro that preparations were being carried out only for defensive, not offensive, operations. In fact, because of the Germans' efforts, the Allies were led to believe that a new defensive army was being formed around R1 quarter Seldorf in the Northern Rhine, possibly to defend against British attack. This was done by increasing the number of flak batteries in the area and the artificial multiplication of radio transmissions in the area. The Allies at this point thought the information was of no importance. All of this meant that the attack, when it came, completely surprised the Allied forces. Remarkably, the U.S. 3rd Army Intelligence Chief, Colonel Oscar Koch, the U.S. 1st Army Intelligence Chief and the SHAF Intelligence Officer all correctly predicted the German offensive capability and intention to strike the U.S. 8 Corps area. These predictions were largely dismissed by the U.S. 12th Army Group. Historian Patrick K. O'Donnell writes that on December 8, 1944, U.S. Rangers at great cost took Hill 400 during the Battle of the Ha One Quarter at TGN Forest. Your next day GIs who relieved the Rangers reported a considerable movement of German troops inside the Ardennes in the enemy's rear, but that no one in the chain of command connected the dots. Because the Ardennes was considered a quiet sector, economy of force considerations led it to be used as a training ground for new units and a rest area for units that had seen hard fighting. The U.S. units deployed in the Ardennes thus were a mixture of inexperienced troops, and battle-hardened troops sent to that sector to recuperate. Two major special operations were planned for the offensive. By October it was decided that Otto Skorzny, the German commando who had rescued the former Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, was to lead a task force of English-speaking German soldiers in Operation Grief. These soldiers were to be dressed in American and British uniforms and wear dog tags taken from corpses and POWs. Their job was to go behind American lines and change signposts, misdirect traffic, generally cause disruption and seize bridges across the Meuse River between Liège and Namur. By late November, another ambitious special operation was added, Colonel Friedrich August von der Ett was to lead a false Chermja currency gear camp group in Operation Station Paragraphsa, a nighttime paratroop drop behind the Allied lines aimed at capturing a vital road junction near Malmedy. German intelligence had set December 20 as the expected date for the start of the upcoming Soviet offensive, aimed at crashing what was left of German resistance on the Eastern Front and thereby opening the way to Berlin. It was hoped that Soviet leader Stalin would delay the start of the operation once the German assault in the Ardennes had begun and wait for the outcome before continuing. After the 20 July plot attempt on Hitler's life, and the close advance of the Red Army, Hitler and his staff had been forced to abandon the Wolf Sanzi headquarters in East Prussia, in which they had coordinated much of the fighting on the Eastern Front. After a brief visit to Berlin, Hitler travelled on his far one quarter S on de Essen on December 11, taking up residence in the Adlist Command Complex, co located with OB West's base at Kranzberg Castle. Believing in omens and the successes of his early war campaigns that had been planned at Kranzberg, Hitler had chosen the site from which he had overseen the successful 1940 campaign against France and the Low Countries. Von Rundstedt set up his operational headquarters near Limburg, close enough for the generals and Panzer Corps commanders who were to lead the attack to visit Adlist on December 11, 
traveling there in an SS-operated bus convoy. With the castle acting as overflow accommodation, the main party was settled into the Adlist's House II command bunker, including General Alfred Jodol, General Wilhelm Keitel, General Bloom Trite, von Mantufel and SS. General Sepp Dietrich. Von Rundstedt then ran through the battle plan, while Hitler made one of his stoic speeches. In a personal conversation on December 13 between Walther Model and Friedrich von der Ett, who was put in charge of Operation Station Paragraphs, von der Ett gave Operation Station Paragraphs a less than a 10% chance of succeeding. Model told him it was necessary to make the attempt, it must be done because this offensive is the last chance to conclude the war favorably. Initial German Assault On December 16, 1944, at 5.30, the Germans began the assault with a massive, 90-minute artillery barrage using 1,600 artillery pieces across a 130-kilometer front on the Allied troops facing the 6th Panzer Army. The Americans' initial impression was that this was the anticipated, localized counterattack resulting from the Allies' recent attack in the wall Eriot sector to the north, where the 2nd Division had knocked a sizable dent in the Siegfried Line. In the northern sector Dietrich's 6th Panzer Army was held up for almost 24 hours by a single reconnaissance platoon and four U.S. forward artillery observers dug in on a ridge overlooking a key road intersection in the village of Lanzareth. They then assaulted Losham Gap and Elsenborn Ridge in an effort to break through to Liege and Antwerp. Heavy snowstorms engulfed parts of the Ardennes area. While having the desired effect of keeping the Allied aircraft grounded, the weather also proved troublesome for the Germans because poor road conditions hampered their advance. Poor traffic control led to massive traffic jams and fuel shortages in forward units. In the center, von Mantufel's 5th Panzer Army attacked towards Bastogne and St. Vith, both road junctions of great strategic importance. In the south, Brandenburg's 7th Army pushed towards Luxembourg in its efforts to secure the flank from Allied attacks. Only one month before 250 members of the Waffen SS had unsuccessfully tried to recapture the town of Vanden with its castle from the Luxembourgish resistance during the Battle of Vanden. Attack on the Northern Shoulder While the siege of Bastogne is often credited as the central point where the German offensive was stopped, the battle for Elsenborn Ridge was a decisive component of the Battle of the Bulge, deflecting the strongest armoured units of the German advance. The attack was led by one of the best equipped German divisions on the Western Front, the 1st SS Panzer Division. The division made up the lead unit for the entire German 6th Panzer Army. SS Obersturmbahnfall 1 Quarter Rear Joachim Pieper led Camp Grupp Pieper, consisting of 4,800 men and 600 vehicles. It was charged with leading the main effort. The attacks by the 6th Panzer Army's infantry units in the north fared badly because of unexpectedly fierce resistance by the U.S. 2nd and 99th Infantry Divisions. On the first day, an entire German battalion of 500 men was held up for 10 hours at the small village of Lanzareth, through which passed a key route through the Loschen Gap. To preserve the quantity of armor available, the infantry of the 9th Falls Chermjager Regiment, 3rd Falls Chermjager Division, had been ordered to clear the village first. A single 18-man intelligence and reconnaissance platoon from the 99th Infantry Division along with four forward air controllers held up the battalion of about 500 German paratroopers until sunset, about 16.00, causing 92 casualties among the Germans. This created a bottleneck in the German advance. Camp Grupp Pieper, at the head of the SS Obersturpen Far 1 Quarter Rear Sepp Dietrich's 6th Panzer Army had been designated to take the Loschim Loschimer Graben Road, but it was closed by two collapsed overpasses. Pieper did not begin his advance until nearly 16.00, more than 16 hours behind schedule. Camp Grupp Pieper reached Buckholt Station in the early morning of December 17 and quickly captured portions of the 3rd Battalion of the 394th Infantry Regiment. They shortly afterwards seized a U.S. fuel depot at Bar 1 Quarter Lingen, where they paused to refuel before continuing westward. To the north, the 277th Volksknadier Division attempted to break through the defending line of the U.S. 99th Infantry Division and positions of 2nd Infantry Division. The 12th SS Panzer Division, reinforced by additional infantry divisions, 
took the key road junction at Loshimagraben just north of Lanzarith and attacked the twin villages of Rocherith and Crinkled. Their intention was to control the twin villages of Rocherith Crinkled which would clear a path to the high ground of Elsenborn Ridge. Occupation of this dominating terrain would allow control of the roads to the south and west and ensure Sapoli to Camp Grupkeeper's armored task force. The stiff American defense prevented the Germans from reaching the vast array of supplies near the Belgian cities of Liège and Spa and the road network west of the Elsenborn Ridge leading to the Meuse River. After more than ten days of intense battle, they pushed the Americans out of the villages, but were unable to dislodge them from the ridge, where elements of the V Corps of the 1st U.S. Army prevented the German forces from reaching the road network to their west. The 99th Infantry Division as a whole, outnumbered 5 to 1, inflicted casualties in the ratio of 18 to 1. The division lost about 20% of its effective strength including 465 killed and 2,524 evacuated due to wounds, injuries, fatigue, or trench foot. German losses were much higher. In the northern sector opposite the 99th, this included more than 4,000 deaths and the destruction of 60 tanks and big guns. Historian John S. D. Eisenhower wrote. That the action of the 2nd and 99th Divisions on the northern shoulder could be considered the most decisive of the Ardennes campaign. Camp Gruppieper drives west, driving to the southeast of Elsenborn. Camp Gruppieper entered Hansfield, where they encountered one of the 99th Division's rest centers, clogged with confused American troops. They killed many, destroyed a number of American armored units and vehicles, and took several dozen prisoners who were murdered by elements of his force. Pieper easily captured the town and 50,000 U.S. gallons of fuel for his vehicles. Pieper then advanced northwest towards Bar One Quarter Lingen, keeping to the plan to move west, apparently unaware he had nearly taken the town and unknowingly bypassed an opportunity to flank and trap the entire 2nd and 99th Divisions. Pieper turned south to detour around Ha One Quarter Lingen, choosing a route designated Rolban D, as he had been given latitude to choose the best route west. Malmedy Massacre. At 12.30 on December 17, Camp Gruppieper was near the hamlet of Borgnes, on the height halfway between the town of Malmedy and Ligneuville, when they encountered elements of the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion, U.S. 7th Armored Division. After a brief battle the lightly armed Americans surrendered. They were disarmed and, with some other Americans captured earlier sent to stand in a field near the crossroads under light guard. About 15 minutes after Pieper's advance guard passed through, the main body under the command of SS Sturmbanfall one quarter rare Werner par paragraph TSCHKE arrived. For reasons unknown to this day, the SS troopers suddenly opened fire on the prisoners. As soon as the firing began, the prisoners panicked. Most were shot where they stood, though some managed to flee. Accounts of the killing vary, but 84 of the POWs were murdered. A few survived, and news of the killings of prisoners of war raced through Allied lines. Following the end of the war, soldiers and officers of Camp Grupp Pieper, including Joachim Pieper and SS General Sepp Dietrich, were tried for the incident at the Malmedy Massacre trial. She known Massacre. Following the Malmedy Massacre, on New Year's Day 1945, after having previously received orders to take no prisoners, American soldiers shot approximately 60 German prisoners of war near the Belgian village of Chinon. Germans advanced west, by the evening the spearhead had pushed north to engage the U.S. 99th Infantry Division and Camp Gruppieper arrived in front of Stave Lot. Pieper's forces was already behind his timetable because of the stiff American resistance and because when the Americans fell back, their engineers blew up bridges and emptied fuel dumps. Pieper's unit was delayed and his vehicles denied critically needed fuel. They took 36 hours to advance from Eiffel to Stavelot, while the same advance had taken just nine hours in 1940. Camp Grupp Pieper attacked Stavelot on December 18 but was unable to capture the town before the Americans evacuated a large fuel depot. Three tanks attempted to take the bridge but the lead vehicle was disabled by a mine. Following this, 60 grenadiers advanced forward but were stopped by concentrated American defensive fire. After a fierce tank battle the next day, 
the Germans finally entered the village when U.S. engineers failed to blow the bridge. Capitalizing on his success and not wanting to lose more time, people rushed an advance group toward the vital bridge at Trois Ponts, leaving the bulk of his strength in stave lot. When they reached it at 11.30 on December 18, retreating U.S. engineers blew it up in their faces. People detoured north towards the villages of Lagles and Chenu. At Chenu, the advance guard was attacked by American fighter bombers, destroying two tanks and five half-tracks, blocking the narrow road. The group got moving again at dusk at 16 o'clock and was able to return to its original route at around 18.00. Of the two bridges now remaining between Camp Grotpieper and the Meuse, the bridge over the Lien was blown by the Americans as the Germans approached. Pieper turned north and halted his forces in the woods between Lagles and Stumont. He learned that Stumont was strongly held and that the Americans were bringing up strong reinforcements from Spa. To Pieper's south, the advance of Camp Grop Hansen had stalled. SS Oberfar 1 quarter air MOHNK ordered Schnellgrop Nittel which had been designated to follow Hansen, to instead move forward to support Pieper. SS Sturmbanfall one quarter rear Nittel crossed the bridge at Stavelot around 1900 against American forces trying to retake the town. Nittel pressed forward towards Lagles, and shortly afterward the Americans recaptured Stavelot. Pieper and Nittel both faced the prospect of being cut off. German advance halted, at dawn on December 19, Pieper surprised the American defenders of Stumont by sending infantry from the 2nd SS Panzergnadier Regiment in an attack and a company of false Chermja currency gear to infiltrate their lines. He followed this with a panzer attack, gaining the eastern edge of the town. An American tank battalion arrived but, after a two-hour tank battle, Pieper finally captured Stumont at 10.30. Nittel joined up with Pieper and reported the Americans had recaptured Stavelot to their east. Pieper ordered Nittel to retake Stave Lot. Assessing his own situation, he determined that his camp group did not have sufficient fuel to cross the bridge west of Stumont and continue his advance. He maintained his lines west of Stumont for a while, until the evening of December 19 when he withdrew them to the village edge. On the same evening the U.S. 82nd Airborne Division under Major General James Gavin arrived and deployed at Lagles and along Pieper's planned route of advance. German efforts to reinforce people were unsuccessful. Camp Grop Hansen was still struggling against bad road conditions and stiff American resistance on the southern route. Schnellgrop Nittel was forced to disengage from the heights around Stavelot. Camp Grop Sandig, which had been ordered to take Stavelot, launched another attack without success. 6th Panzer Army Commander SS Oberst Trupp in far one quarter rear Sept Dietrich ordered Hermann Pryer commanding officer of the ISS Panzer Corps, to increase its efforts to back Pieper's camp group, but Pryor was unable to break through. Small units of the U.S. 2nd Battalion of the 119th Regiment attacked the dispersed units of Camp Grop Pieper during the morning of December 21, but were pushed back and a number captured, including their battalion commander, Major Hal McCown. Pieper learned that German reinforcements were to be concentrated in Lagles and withdrew his forces eastward, leaving wounded Americans and Germans in the Freud Court Castlier, Fr. Attempting to withdraw from Chenu, American paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division engaged the Germans in fierce house-to-house -house fighting. The Americans shelled Camp Grop Pieper on December 22, and although the Germans had run out of food and had virtually no fuel, they continued to fight. A Luftwaffe resupply mission went badly when SS Brigade Far 1 Quarter Rear Wilhelm MOHNK insisted the grid coordinates supplied by Pieper were wrong, parachuting supplies into American hands in Stumont. In Lagles, Pieper set up defenses waiting for German relief. When the relief force was unable to penetrate the Allied lines, he decided to break through the Allied lines and return to the German lines on December 23. The men of the camp group were forced to abandon their vehicles and heavy equipment, although most of what remained of the unit was able to escape. Operation Station Paragraphsa Operation Station Paragraphsa was a paratroop drop into the American rear in the high fence area. The objective was the Barrack Michel Crossroads. It was led by Oberst Friedrich August Freer von der Erde, considered by Germans to be a hero of the Battle of Crete. 
it was the German paratroopers' only nighttime drop during World War II. Von der Ette was given only eight days to prepare prior to the assault. He was not allowed to use his own regiment because their movement might alert the Allies to the impending counterattack. Instead, he was provided with a camp group of 800 men. The two parachute corps was tasked with contributing 100 men from each of its regiments. In loyalty to their commander, 150 men from von der Hitt's own unit, the 6th Parachute Regiment, went against orders and joined him. They had little time to establish any unit cohesion or train together. The parachute drop was a complete failure. Von der Ette ended up with a total of around 300 troops. Too small and too weak to counter the Allies, they abandoned plans to take the crossroads and instead converted his mission to reconnaissance. With only enough ammunition for a single fight, they withdrew towards Germany and attacked the rear of the American lines. Only about 100 of his weary men finally reached the German rear. Werrith 11. Another, much smaller massacre was committed in Werrith, Belgium, approximately 1,000 yards northeast of St. Beth, on December 17, 1944. Eleven black American soldiers were tortured after surrendering and then shot, by men of the 1st SS Panzer Division belonging to Camp Grupp Nittel. The perpetrators were never punished for this crime and recent research indicates that men from 3rd Company of the Reconnaissance Battalion were responsible. Attack in the center. The Germans fared better in the center Schnee-Eifel sector, as the 5th Panzer Army attacked positions held by the U.S. 28th and 106th Infantry Divisions. The Germans lacked the overwhelming strength that had been deployed in the north but still possessed a marked numerical and material superiority over the very thinly spread 28th and 106th Divisions. They succeeded in surrounding two largely intact regiments of the 106th Division in a pincer movement and forced their surrender, a tribute to the way Mantufel's new tactics had been applied. The official U.S. Army history states, at least 7,000 men were lost here and the figure probably is closer to 8 or 9,000. The amount lost in arms and equipment, of course, was very substantial. The Schnee-Eifel battle, therefore, represents the most serious reverse offered by American arms during the operations of 1944 a Euro 45 in the European theater. Battle for St. Beth, in the center of the town of St. Beth, a vital road junction, presented the main challenge for both von Mantufels and Dietrich's forces. The defenders, led by the 7th Armored Division and including the remaining regiment of the 106th U.S. Infantry Division, with elements of the 9th Armored Division and 28th U.S. Infantry Division, all under the command of General Bruce C. Clark, successfully resisted the German attacks, significantly slowing the German advance. At Montgomery's orders, St. Vith was evacuated on December 21. U.S. troops fell back to entrenched positions in the area presenting an imposing obstacle to a successful German advance. By December 23, as the Germans shattered their flanks, the defenders' position became untenable and U.S. troops were ordered to retreat west of the Somme River. Since the German plan called for the capture of St. Vith by 1800 on December 17, the prolonged action in and around it dealt a major setback to their timetable. Meuse River Bridges To protect the river crossings on the Meuse at Javit, Dinant and Lemur, Montgomery ordered those few units available to hold the bridges on December 19. This led to a hastily assembled force including rear echelon troops, military police and Army Air Force personnel. The British 29th Armoured Brigade, which had turned in its tanks for re-equipping, was told to take back their tanks and head to the area. XXX Corps in the Netherlands began their move to the area on December 20. The 6th Airborne Division in the UK was ordered to ports for ferrying to France. Aside from the difficulties in the northern and southern sectors, the German advance in the centre was the most successful. 5th Panzer Army was spearheaded by the 2nd Panzer Division while Panzer Lu Division came up from the south, leaving Bastogne to other units. The Orth River was passed at Ortheville on December 21. Lack of fuel held up the advance for one day but on December 23 the offensive was resumed towards the two small towns of Hargemont and March. Hargemont was captured the same day, 
but March was strongly defended by the American 84th Division. General La One Quarter TTWITZ, commander of the XXXXVII Panzer Corps, ordered the division to turn westwards towards Dinant and the Meuse, leaving only a blocking force at March. Although advancing only in a narrow corridor, 2nd Panzer Division was still making rapid headway, leading to jubilation in Berlin. Headquarters now freed up the 9th Panzer Division for 5th Panzer Army, which was deployed in March. On 22-December 23 the woods of Foy Notre Dame were reached, only a few kilometers ahead of Dinant. However, the narrow corridor caused considerable difficulties, as constant flanking attacks threatened the division. On December 24 the furthest penetration was reached. Panzer Lu Division took the town of Sells, while a bit farther north, parts of 2nd Panzer Division were in sight of the Meuse near Dinant at Foy Notre Dame. A hastily assembled Allied blocking force on the east side of the river, however, prevented the German probing forces from approaching the Dinant Bridge. By late Christmas Eve the advance in this sector was stopped as Allied forces threatened the narrow corridor held by the 2nd Panzer Division. Operation Grief and Operation Wackerency Rung For Operation Grief, Otis Skorzny successfully infiltrated a small part of his battalion of English-speaking Germans disguised in American uniforms behind the Allied lines. Although they failed to take the vital bridges over the Meuse, their presence caused confusion out of all proportion to their military activities, and rumors spread quickly. Even General George Patton was alarmed and, on December 17, described the situation to General Dwight Eisenhower as Krautzer Euro speaking perfect English a Euro raising hell, cutting wires, turning road signs around, spooking whole divisions, and shoving a bulge into our defenses. Checkpoints were set up all over the Allied rear, greatly slowing the movement of soldiers and equipment. American MPs at these checkpoints grilled troops on things that every American was expected to know, like the identity of Mickey Mouse's girlfriend, baseball scores, or the capital of a particular U.S. state or euro though many could not remember or did not know. General Omar Bradley was briefly detained when he correctly identified Springfield as the capital of Illinois because the American MP who questioned him mistakenly believed the capital was Chicago. The tightened security nonetheless made things very hard for the German infiltrators, and a number of them were captured. Even during interrogation, they continued their goal of spreading disinformation. When asked about their mission, some of them claimed they had been told to go to Paris to either kill or capture General Dwight Eisenhower. Security around the general was greatly increased, and Eisenhower was confined to his headquarters. Because Skorzny's men were captured in American uniforms, they were executed as spies. This was the standard practice of every army at the time, as many belligerents considered it necessary to protect their territory against the grave dangers of enemy spying. Skorzny said that he was told by German legal experts that as long he did not order his men to fight in combat while wearing American uniforms, such a tactic was a legitimate ruse of war. Skorzny and his men were fully aware of their likely fate and most wore their German uniforms underneath their American ones in case of capture. Skorzny was tried by an American military tribunal in 1947 at the Dachau trials for allegedly violating the laws of war stemming from his leadership of Operation Grief, but was acquitted. He later moved to Spain and South America. In Operation Wackerency Rung, a small number of German agents infiltrated Allied lines in American uniforms. These agents were then to use an existing Nazi intelligence network to attempt to bribe rail and port workers to disrupt Allied supply operations. However, this operation was a failure. Attack in the South Further south on Mantufel's front, the main thrust was delivered by all attacking divisions crossing the river R, then increasing the pressure on the key road centers of St. Vith and Bastogne. The more experienced 28th Infantry Division put up a much more dogged defense than the inexperienced soldiers of the 106th Infantry Division. The 112th Infantry Regiment, holding a continuous front east of the R, kept German troops from seizing and using the R River bridges around our Ren for two days, before withdrawing progressively westwards. The 109th and 110th Regiments of the 28th Division, however, fared worse 
as they were spread so thinly that their positions were easily bypassed. Both offered stubborn resistance in the face of superior forces and threw the German schedule off by several days. The 110th Air situation was by far the worst, as it was responsible for an 18-kilometer front while its 2nd Battalion was withheld as the divisional reserve. Panzer columns took the outlying villages and widely separated strongpoints in bitter fighting, and advanced to points near Bastogne within four days. The struggle for the villages and American strongpoints, plus transport confusion on the German side, slowed the attack sufficiently to allow the 101st Airborne Division to reach Bastogne by truck on the morning of December 19. A fierce defense of Bastogne, in which American paratroopers particularly distinguished themselves, made it impossible for the Germans to take the town with its important road junctions. The panzer columns swung past on either side, cutting off Bastogne on December 20 but failing to secure the vital crossroads. In the extreme south, Brandenburg's three infantry divisions were checked by divisions of the U.S. 8 Corps after an advance of 6.4 km. That front was then firmly held. Only the 5th Parachute Division of Brandenburg's command was able to thrust forward 19 a km on the inner flank to partially fulfill its assigned role. Eisenhower and his principal commanders realized by December 17 that the fighting in the Ardennes was a major offensive and not a local counterattack, and they ordered vast reinforcements to the area. Within a week 250,000 troops had been sent. General Gavin of the 82nd Airborne Division arrived on the scene first and ordered the 101st to hold Bastogne while the 82nd would take the more difficult task of facing the SS Panzer Divisions. It was also thrown into the battle north of the Bulge, near Elsenborn Ridge. Siege of Bastogne By the time the senior Allied commanders met in a bunker in Verdun on December 19, the town of Bastogne and its network of eleven hard-topped roads leading through the mountainous terrain and boggy mud of the Ardennes region were to have been in German hands for several days. By the time of that meeting, two separate westbound German columns that were to have bypassed the town to the south and north, the 2nd Panzer Division and Panzer Lu Division of XLVII Panzer Corps, as well as the Corps Infantry, coming due west had been engaged and much slowed and frustrated in outlying battles at defensive positions up to 16 kilometers from the town proper Euro, and were gradually being forced back onto and into the hasty defenses built within the municipality. Moreover, the sole corridor that was open was threatened and it had been sporadically closed as the front shifted, and there was expectation that it would be completely closed sooner than later, given the strong likelihood that the town would soon be surrounded. General Eisenhower, realizing that the Allies could destroy German forces much more easily when they were out in the open and on the offensive than if they were on the defensive, told his generals, the present situation is to be regarded as one of opportunity for us and not of disaster. There will be only cheerful faces at this table. Patton, realizing what Eisenhower implied, responded, Hell, let's have the guts to let the bastards go all the way to Paris. Then, will really cut him off and chew him up. Eisenhower, after saying he was not that optimistic, asked Patton how long it would take to turn his Third Army north to counterattack. Patton replied that he could attack with two divisions within 48 hours, to the disbelief of the other generals present. However, before he had gone to the meeting Patton had ordered his staff to prepare three contingency plans for a northward turn in at least core strength. By the time Eisenhower asked him how long it would take, the movement was already underway. On December 20, Eisenhower removed the 1st and 9th U.S. Armies from General Bradley's 12th Army Group and placed them under Montgomery's 21st Army Group. By December 21 the Germans had surrounded Bastogne, which was defended by the 101st Airborne Division and Combat Command B of the 10th Armored Division. Conditions inside the perimeter were tough for Euro most of the medical supplies and medical personnel had been captured. Food was scarce, and by December 22 artillery ammunition was restricted to 10 rounds per gun per day. The weather cleared the next day, however, and supplies were dropped over four of the next five days. Despite determined German attacks, however, the perimeter held. The German commander Lieutenant General Heinrich Freer von La One Quarter TTWITZ requested Bastogne's surrender. 
when Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, acting commander of the 101st, was told of the Nazi demand to surrender, in frustration he responded, nuts. After turning to other pressing issues, his staff reminded him that they should reply to the German demand. One officer, Lieutenant Colonel Harry Kinnard, noted that McAuliffe's initial reply would be tough to beat. Thus McAuliffe wrote on the paper, which was typed up and delivered to the Germans, the line he made famous and a morale booster to his troops, nuts. That reply had to be explained, both to the Germans and to non-American allies. Both 2nd Panzer and Panzer Lu moved forward from Bastogne after December 21, leaving only Panzer Lu's 901st Regiment to assist the 26th Volkskanadier Division in attempting to capture the crossroads. The 26th VG received one Panzergnadier Regiment from the 15th Panzergnadier Division on Christmas Eve for its main assault the next day. Because it lacked sufficient troops and those of the 26th VG Division were near exhaustion, the XLVII Panzer Corps concentrated its assault on several individual locations on the west side of the perimeter in sequence rather than launching one simultaneous attack on all sides. The assault, despite initial success by its tanks in penetrating the American line, was defeated and all the tanks destroyed. The next day, December 26, the spearhead of General Patton's 4th Armored Division broke through and opened a corridor to Bastogne. Allied Counteroffensive On December 23, the weather conditions started improving, allowing the Allied air forces to attack. They launched devastating bombing raids on the German supply points in their rear, and P-47 Thunderbolts started attacking the German troops on the roads. Allied air forces also helped the defenders of Bastogne, dropping much-needed supplies of Euro medicine, food, blankets, and ammunition. A team of volunteer surgeons flew in by military glider and began operating in a tool room. By December 24, the German advance was effectively stalled short of the Meuse. Units of the British XXX Corps were holding the bridges at Dinant, Javit, and Namur and US units were about to take over. The Germans had outrun their supply lines, and shortages of fuel and ammunition were becoming critical. Up to this point the German losses had been light notably in armor, which was almost untouched with the exception of Pieper's losses. On the evening of December 24, General Hasso von Mantufel recommended to Hitler's military adjutant a halt to all offensive operations and a withdrawal back to the West Wall. Hitler rejected this. However disagreement and confusion at the Allied command prevented a strong response, throwing away the opportunity for a decisive action. In the center, on Christmas Eve, the 2nd Armored Division attempted to attack and cut off the spearheads of the 2nd Panzer Division at the Meuse, while the units from the 4th Cavalry Group kept the 9th Panzer Division at March busy. As a result, parts of the 2nd Panzer Division were cut off. Panzer Lu tried to relieve them, but was only partially successful, as the perimeter held. For the next two days the perimeter was strengthened. On 26 and 27 December the trapped units of 2nd Panzer Division made two breakout attempts, again only with partial success, as major quantities of equipment fell into Allied hands. Further Allied pressure out of March finally led the German command to the conclusion that no further offensive action towards the Meuse was possible. In the south, Patton's 3rd Army was battling to relieve Bastogne. At 16.50 on December 26, the lead element, Company D, 37th Tank Battalion of the 4th Armored Division, reached Bastogne, ending the siege. German Counterattack On January 1, in an attempt to keep the offensive going, the Germans launched two new operations. At 9.15, the Luftwaffe launched in Turnemann Bodenplatt, a major campaign against Allied airfields in the Low Countries. Hundreds of planes attacked Allied airfields destroying or severely damaging some 465 aircraft. However, the Luftwaffe lost 277 planes, 62 to Allied fighters and 172 mostly because of an unexpectedly high number of Allied flak guns, set up to protect against German V-1 flying bomb attacks and using proximity-fused shells, but also by friendly fire from the German flak guns that were uninformed of the pending large-scale German air operation. 
the Germans suffered heavy losses at an airfield named Y-29, losing 24 of their own planes while downing only one American plane. While the Allies recovered from their losses in just days, the operation left the Luftwaffe weak and ineffective for the remainder of the war. On the same day, German Army Group G and Army Group Upper Rhine launched a major offensive against the thinly stretched, 110 km line of the 7th U.S. Army. This offensive, known as Unternehmen Nordwind, was the last major German offensive of the war on the Western Front. The weakened 7th Army had, at Eisenhower's orders, sent troops, equipment, and supplies north to reinforce the American armies in the Ardennes, and the offensive left it in dire straits. By January 15, 7th Army's VI Corps was fighting on three sides in Alsace. With casualties mounting, and running short on replacements, tanks, ammunition, and supplies, 7th Army was forced to withdraw to defensive positions on the south bank of the Moda River on January 21. The German offensive drew to a close on January 25. In the bitter, desperate fighting of Operation Nordwind, VI Corps, which had borne the brunt of the fighting, suffered a total of 14,716 casualties. The total for 7th Army for January was 11,609. Total casualties included at least 9,000 wounded. First, 3rd and 7th Army suffered a total of 17,000 hospitalized from the cold. Allies prevail. While the German offensive had ground to a halt, they still controlled a dangerous salient in the Allied line. Patton's 3rd Army in the south, centered around Bastogne, would attack north, Montgomery's forces in the north would strike south, and the two forces planned to meet at Hoofalize. The temperature during January 1945 was extremely low. Weapons had to be maintained and truck engines run every half hour to prevent their oil from congealing. The offensive went forward regardless. Eisenhower wanted Montgomery to go on the counter-offensive on January 1 with the aim of meeting up with Patton's advancing Third Army and cutting off most of the attacking Germans, trapping them in a pocket. However, Montgomery, refusing to risk underprepared infantry in a snowstorm for a strategically unimportant area, did not launch the attack until January 3, by which time substantial numbers of German troops had already managed to fall back successfully, but at the cost of losing most of their heavy equipment. At the start of the offensive, the 1st and 3rd U.S. armies were separated by about 40 a km. American progress in the south was also restricted to about a kilometer a day. The majority of the German force executed a successful fighting withdrawal and escaped the battle area, although the fuel situation had become so dire that most of the German armor had to be abandoned. On January 7, 1945, Hitler agreed to withdraw all forces from the Ardennes, including the SS Panzer divisions, thus ending all offensive operations. However, considerable fighting went on for another three weeks. St. Vith was recaptured by the Americans on January 23 and the last German units participating in the offensive did not return to their start line until January 25. Winston Churchill, addressing the House of Commons following the Battle of the Bulge said, This is undoubtedly the greatest American battle of the war and will, I believe be regarded as an ever-famous American victory. Controversy at high command As the Ardennes crisis developed, Montgomery assumed command of the American 1st and 9th Armies. This operational change in command was approved by Eisenhower, as the Northern Armies had lost all communications with Bradley, who was based in Luxembourg. The northern flank of the front had lost all communications, not only with the U.S. command structure, but also with adjacent units. Without radio or telephone communication Montgomery managed to improvise an effective command and control system based on those of the Duke of Wellington's gallopers of the Battle of Waterloo. Due to the news blackout imposed on the 16th, this change of leadership did not become known to the outside world until eventually SHAEF made a public announcement making clear that the change in command was absolutely nothing to do with failure on the part of the three American generals. This resulted in headlines in British newspapers. The story was also covered in Stars and Stripes and for the first time British contribution to the fighting was mentioned. Montgomery asked Churchill if he could give a conference to the press to explain the situation. 
Though some of his staff were concerned at the image it would give, the conference had been cleared by Alan Brook, the CIGS, who was possibly the only person who Monty would listen to. On the same day as Hitler's withdrawal order, January 7, Montgomery held his press conference at Sonhaven. Montgomery started with giving credit to the courage and good fighting quality of the American troops, characterizing a typical American as a very brave fighting man who has that tenacity in battle which makes a great soldier, and went on to talk about the necessity of Allied teamwork, and praised Eisenhower, stating, Teamwork wins battles and battle victories win wars. On our team, the captain is General Ike. Then Montgomery described the course of the battle for a half hour. Coming to the end of his speech he said he had employed the whole available power of the British group of armies. This power was brought into play very gradually. Finally it was put into battle with a banger. You thus have the picture of British troops fighting on both sides of the Americans who have suffered a hard blow. He stated he had headed off a seen off a and a written off the Germans. The battle has been the most interesting. I think possibly one of the most interesting and tricky battles I have ever handled. Despite his positive remarks about American soldiers, the overall impression given by Montgomery, at least in the years of the American military leadership, was that he had taken the lion's share of credit for the success of the campaign, and had been responsible for rescuing the besieged Americans. His comments were interpreted as self-promoting, particularly his claiming that when the situation began to deteriorate, Eisenhower had placed him in command in the North. Patton and Eisenhower both felt this was a misrepresentation of the relative share of the fighting played by the British and Americans in the Ardennes, and that it belittled the part played by Bradley, Patton and other American commanders. In the context of Patton's and Montgomery's well-known antipathy, Montgomery's failure to mention the contribution of any American general beside Eisenhower was seen as insulting. Indeed, General Bradley and his American commanders were already starting their counterattack by the time Montgomery was given command of 1st and 9th U.S. armies. Focusing exclusively on his own generalship, Montgomery continued to say he thought the counteroffensive had gone very well but did not explain the reason for his delayed attack on January 3. He later attributed this to needing more time for preparation on the Northern Front. According to Winston Churchill, the attack from the south under Patton was steady but slow and involved heavy losses, and Montgomery was trying to avoid this situation. Montgomery subsequently recognized his error and later wrote, I think now that I should never have held that press conference. So great were the feelings against me on the part of the American generals that whatever I said was bound to be wrong. I should therefore have said nothing. Eisenhower commented in his own memoirs. I doubt if Montgomery ever came to realize how resentful some American commanders were. They believed he had belittled Thema Euro, and they were not slow to voice reciprocal scorn and contempt. Bradley and Patton both threatened to resign unless Montgomery's command was changed. Eisenhower, encouraged by his British deputy Arthur Tedder, had decided to sack Montgomery. However, intervention by Montgomery's and Eisenhower's chiefs of staff Major General Freddie de Gingand, and Lieutenant General Walter Bedell Smith, moved Eisenhower to reconsider and allowed Montgomery to apologize. The German commander of the 5th Panzer Army, Hasso von Mantufel said of Montgomery's leadership. The operations of the American First Army had developed into a series of individual holding actions. Montgomery's contribution to restoring the situation was that he turned a series of isolated actions into a coherent battle fought according to a clear and definite plan. It was his refusal to engage in premature and piecemeal counterattacks which enabled the Americans to gather their reserves and frustrate the German attempts to extend their breakthrough. Aftermath Casualty estimates from the battle vary widely. The official U.S. account lists 80,987 American casualties, while other estimates range from 70,000 to 108,000. According to the U.S. Department of Defense the American forces suffered 89,500 casualties including 19,000 killed, 47,500 wounded and 23,000 missing. An official report by the United States Department of the Army lists some 108,347 casualties, including 19,246 killed, 
62,489 wounded and 26,612 captured and missing. The Battle of the Bulge was the bloodiest of the battles that U.S. forces experienced in World War II. The 19,000 American dead were unsurpassed by those of any other engagement. British losses totaled 1,400. The German High Command's official figure for the campaign was 84,834 casualties, and other estimates range between 60,000 and 100,000. The Allies pressed their advantage following the battle. By the beginning of February 1945, the lines were roughly where they had been in December 1944. In early February, the Allies launched an attack all along the Western Front, in the north under Montgomery toward Arkin. In the center, under Courtney Hodges. And in the south, under Patton. Montgomery's behavior during the months of December and January, including the press conference on January 7 where he appeared to downplay the contribution of the American generals, further soured his relationship with his American counterparts through to the end of the war. The German losses in the battle were critical in several respects, the last of the German reserves were now gone, the Luftwaffe had been shattered and the remaining German forces in the west were being pushed back to the defences of the Siegfried Line. In response to the early success of the offensive, on January 6 Churchill contacted Stalin to request that the Soviets put pressure on the Germans on the Eastern Front. On January 12, the Soviets began a massive Vistula Euro order offensive, originally planned for January 20. During World War II, most U.S. black soldiers still served only in maintenance or service positions, or in segregated units. Because of troop shortages during the Battle of the Bulge, Eisenhower decided to integrate the service for the first time. This was an important step toward a desegregated United States military. More than 2,000 black soldiers had volunteered to go to the front. A total of 708 black Americans were killed in combat during World War II. See also, German occupation of Luxembourg in World War II, Operation Spring Awakening, Notes. References. Bibliography. Further reading, L. Staub, Peter, Hitler's Last Offensive, Barnsley, Pen and Sword Military Classics, ISBN A0-85052-984-0A, von Luttekau, Charles V. Chapter 20, The German Counteroffensive Counteroffensive in the Ardennes, in Kent Roberts Greenfield, Command Decisions, United States Army Center of Military History, CMH Pub 70-7A, External Links. Battle of the Bulge Euro official webpage of the United States Army. The Battle of the Bulge, Battlebook U.S. Army Europe, Battle of the Bulge original reports and pictures from the Times, Battle of the Bulge, rare, unseen a Euro slideshow by Life magazine, nuts. Revisited, an interview with Lieutenant General Harry W. O. Kinnard, veterans of the Battle of the Bulge official online home, we owe our freedom to GIs who fought Battle of the Bulge by Peter Thomas veteran of the Hurtgen Forest and Bulge Battles. Battle of the Bulge Pictures are Euro photos courtesy of www.picturees.com. Battle of the Bulge Museums are Euro a list of Battle of the Bulge Museums near the previous battlefield. Oral history interview with Patrick J. Fay, an infantry scout during the Battle of the Bulge from the Veterans History Project at Central Connecticut State University. Oral history interview with Frank Ludwig an officer who worked on the logistics of the Battle of the Bulge from the Veterans History Project at Central Connecticut State University, American Experience a Euro The Battle of the Bulge a Euro PBS documentary, produced by Thomas F. Lennon. Personalized History a Euro Personal Diary account from a radio operator in the 101st Airborne during the Battle of the Bulge. An infantryman in the Battle of the Bulge, the short film Air Army Invades Germany is available for free download at the Internet Archive, more, a film clip Allies Fight Fierce Nazi Counter Blow, 194,420 is available for free download at the Internet Archive, more, on the British forces that fought in the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge and Malmedy Massacre, Battle of the Bulge Monument on Staten Island, New York.